Good morning. And thank you to Nat and Beth <clears throat> for all you put together here and for having me again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or the TAVAR, which I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with at this point. It's not a new procedure anymore. Um, so, but basically, it's an aortic valve replacement that's done through a catheter approach. We have several access points that we can use, percutaneous femoral, femoral cutdown, sub, uh, subclavian access, direct aortic, and, and uh, transapical. Now, this is a procedure that can be done under MAC or general anesthesia. Uh, it's something that 90% of our patients, I mean, if they're percutaneous femoral, we do them under MAC. We avoid intubation, and it's a great, great uh, advantage. Um, basically, the native aortic valve remains and is displaced by the new valve implantation, and once this new prosthetic valve is in place, it begins to function, and it's indicated for use in those with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis that is due to a de degenerative calcific uh, aortic valve. So what is the etiology of this? The mechanisms are similar to that of atherosclerosis. It's mainly solid cal calcium deposits within the valve cusps, and this leads to a progressive calcification and thickening of the leaflets that don't allow them to open easily or move fully. It's similar to risk factors that contribute to coronary artery disease and those that uh, there's a high coincidence of those that have coronary artery disease and also have aortic stenosis. And it's something that generally occurs in the sixth, seventh, and eighth generations of life. And if you can see here my, my picture, you see a nice, beautiful, normal aortic valve, and you see a calcific valve here. Now, a normal aortic valve should open to three to four centimeters squared. Once it's less than one centimeter squared, that's when it's considered to be severe. And if it's less than, opening less than 0.7 centimeters, that's when we consider this to be a critical aortic stenosis. What is the prevalence? It's actually the most prevalent native valve disease, and 2% of those over 65, 3% over 75, and 4% of people over 85 have the disease. And we're diagnosing over 100,000 people with this disease every year. Now, if you look at the symptoms, the, the, sim the classic symptoms are angina, syncope, and heart failure. But once you have the symptoms of heart failure and dyspnea, this is what foretells the worst outlook for these patients. And you can see by this survival curve here, you have this latent period, and then all of a sudden you have the onset of severe symptoms. And look at this rapid decline in survival. <clears throat> So what was the rationale for developing this procedure? Surgical aortic valve replacement was the gold standard. It reduces symptoms, improves survival, we know it works. However, over 30% of people were not being treated that had this disease. And it was because they were considered to be a high or prohibitive risk for surgery. So of course, developing a minimally invasive procedure to treat these patients has been an amazing, promising alternative. What are the benefits of the TAVR? We know this from the studies that have been done. We have a reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and repeat hospitalizations. We have improvement in their gradient. We have improvement in their valve area, their heart association functional class, their six-minute walk test, and their quality of life, which, of course, is the most important thing. What are the potential adverse events? Any procedure comes with potential adverse events. We're working, and everything we do and strive for in the future is to reduce these. But of course, stroke is one of our biggest um, concerns. You're manipulating inside of a calcified valve. And so there's always a concern for debris and calcium to come off during the procedure and contribute to a stroke. Valve dysfunction or paravalvular leak. This is a leaking that occurs around the valve, you know, and this occurs because of malposition, whether the valve is implanted too high or too low, but also these masses of calcium that are coming off of the annulus that don't allow this good seal of the valve. And this is important, especially if you're left with moderate or severe paravalvular leak because it does correlate with mortality. Conduction disturbance and need for pacemaker. You know, this is something that, you know, the design of the device, where it sits in relationship to the AV node and the bundle branches, that is a concern. Annular rupture, again, balloon, valve placement in a calcified valve, 
you're concerned that you're going to rupture the annulus, and that would be a devastating event. You have to watch your wire. You have a stiff wire in the ventricle, and so you're always concerned for LV perforation, which would lead to tamponade, urgent need for surgery. Acute MI, albeit low risk, um, we do have to look at the uh, distance of the coronary ostea to the annulus. And when we put the valve in place, you know, are we going to potentially occlude the coronary ostea? Thrombosis, infection, and death. So this is the Medtronic uh, core valve classic. This is the first generation core valve. This was the US pivotal trial. Um, we proudly uh, implanted the first Medtronic core valve in the United States here at Mount Sinai. Um, and this is a nitinol frame. It's a self-expanding valve. It's a porcine pericardial tissue. And this came with an 18 French sheath. This is the Medtronic core valve Evolute R. Again, a study that we participated in at Sinai. Um, slightly different design, a little bit shorter, um, but uh, still porcine pericardial tissue, 14 front sheath. So we're always striving, right, to like improve outcomes and reduce the risks. So um, decreasing the sheath size, decreasing the risk of vascular and bleeding complications. But the other amazing thing about this valve is that it's retrievable. So, you know, again, going back to the whole, you know, if you malpositioned, you can cause paravalvular leak. It also, if you're too deep, increases the risk for a pacemaker need. So we can actually, um, you know, release this valve to a certain extent, do an aortogram, and if we're like, uh, this is not a good position, we can actually recapture it so that we can reposition it, get it in a good place, and have a better outcome. So Edward Sapien valve. So on the left, you, uh, this is the first generation Edwards valve. This was the partner study, first study in, um, in the United States uh, with the transcatheter heart valve. And this was a stainless steel frame, a bovine pericardial tissue, a balloon expandable valve, 22 or 24 French, huge. Um, on the right, you have the XT Sapien. This was the second generation Edwards valve. Now, this is a chromium cobalt frame for better apposition, better sealing, reducing that risk of paravalvular leak, still a bovine pericardial tissue, still balloon expandable, but 18 front sheath. So from 24 to 18. So reducing that risk of vascular and bleeding complications and risks that we're concerned about. Now, this is the Sapien 3. This is the third generation Edwards valve, FDA approved. This is the valve we're now using. It's still chromium cobalt, but you can see that the struts are a lot thinner, which allows, again, for better apposition, lowering that risk of paravalvular leak. And you also have this outer skirt that creates a nice seal. And again, reducing that risk of paravalvular leak. Still bovine pericardial tissues, still balloon expandable. 14 front sheath. So again, as we move on, we're continuing to improve our devices and reduce the risks and the complications that come with the procedure. This is the Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device. This is something, it's not FDA approved yet. However, um, the studies are done. It's closed. We participated in the study at Sinai. Um, it's basically a device that goes through the right radial artery. You have two filters, one that sits in the right brachiocephalic, protecting the right internal carotid, one that sits in the left common carotid. This goes in before we do any pre-BAV, valve implant, post-BAV, it sits, it's there the whole time. And then of course, at the end of the procedure, we take it out. But essentially, it's protecting the patient from any periprocedural stroke. So any debris or calcium that would come off during the procedure will be captured by these filters. So how do we evaluate these patients? Of course, first and foremost is the echo. We have to, you know, does the patient indeed have severe aortic stenosis? Do they have a valve area that, that is less than one centimeter squared? Sometimes we need to do a TEE to better assess this. If their LV systolic function is down, sometimes we need to do a debunamine stress echo. Uh, we do a CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. This is probably one of the most important tests that we do in terms of what is their annulus size? What size valve do we need to put in? What is their access? Are there any anatomical concerns? Cardiac cath, pulmonary function test, carotid duplex. We assess their New York Heart Association functional class. 
this procedure is indicated for those that have class two or greater symptoms. And then also a consult with one of the interventional cardiologists on our TAVR team. Surgical risk assessment. Right now, and oh God, maybe tomorrow this is going to change, but right now this is a procedure that is commercially approved for those that are high risk for surgery or inoperable. Intermediate risk approval, we're just waiting for it. Um, but basically, they all, all of these patients need to be seen by one of the cardiothoracic surgeons on our team. And what the surgeons do is an STS risk score to assess their operative mortality risk, but also they look at incremental risks. And this is actually really important because the STS risk you know, it tells you your operative mortality, but it's not all encompassing. So there are other risk factors that need to be considered to really determine what is this patient's operative mortality risk. But the STS risk considers things, you know, age, have they had prior cardioth cardiothoracic surgery, prior MI, valvular abnorm abnormalities, what's their EF, have, do they have arrhythmia, do they have CKD, diabetes, COPD, all these different things. You kind of put it all into this risk calculator and spits out a, a risk, an operative mortality risk. But again, it's not all encompassing. So other things that the surgeon needs to consider is, you know, does this pay liver disease? Huge, huge thing in terms of uh, increased mortality risk with surgery. Oncologic or hematologic disease. People with autoimmune disease and on chronic steroids. Huge implications for wound healing after surgery. Do they have a hostile mediastinum? You know, can you clamp the aorta and do surgery on this patient? And frailty and mobility impairment is also another huge factor to consider when you look at someone's operative mortality risk. We're not just looking at, not just mortality. What's their morbidity? How are they going to recover from surgery? So these are all of the things that the surgeon sort of looks at to determine, is this patient high risk for surgery? Should they have a TAVR? So TAVR for extreme risk. So these are people, extreme risk, inoperable people, their operative mortality risk is over 15% within 30 days if they were to undergo surgery. We had the Partner 1B study, that was with the Edwards valve, and this was FDA approved in November of 2011. And then we had the Core Valve US Pivotal trial, which was completed in FDA approval in January 2014. And ultimately what this showed is that when you compare the TAVR to optimal medical therapy, I mean, the TAVR blows them out of the water. Uh, we had over a 20% improvement in mortality when you treated patients with TAVR versus optimal medical therapy. So that's a no-brainer. TAVR for high-risk cases. Now, these are people with an operative mortality risk of 10 to 15%. So we had the Partner 1A study. Again, Edwards Valve completed FDA approval May 2012. This study showed, and what we're always trying to prove when we do these studies and we're looking at trying to get a new procedure um, approved, you're always, you're, you're always striving just to prove non-inferiority. That's what you want to prove, which we did with the partner study. Non-inferiority of the TAVR to surgery in high-risk patients. Now, the core valve US pivotal trial in high-risk patients, which we participated in at Sinai, and proudly I will say that we actually implanted the first core valve, high-risk, approved FDA at Sinai during our symposium last year, <laughs> or during our symposium, rather, 2014. But, um, so this study was completed, and this was the first transcatheter heart valve study that actually showed superiority. And we weren't even striving to, 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 to find that. We just wanted to prove we're not inferior. But this, this study found superiority of the TAVR to surgery in high-risk patients in terms of all-cause mortality. So... Tavar for the intermediate risk patients. And this is, again, the, the big thing that we're all biting our nails and waiting for at this point. Um, so we have, so these are people that their operative mortality is 3 to 8%. Two trials, the partner 2A. This is the Sapien 3 device. Completed. Data has been presented at the ACC. Once that happens, we're just waiting for this approval. I mean, we have proved more than prove that the TAVR is appropriate in this risk population. And we are just, any day we are going to get this FDA commercial approval. Um, 
and I'll talk a little bit about the data briefly in a minute, but the Sortavi trial is another intermediate risk uh, study. It's still ongoing. We've participated in this at the Sinai. And uh, both of these trials are one-to-one -one randomization. So 50% of the patients go for surgery, 50% go for TAVAR. But the partner 2A study, just very you know, briefly, um, again, it was a one-to-one -one randomization. 50% of the patients went for surgery, 50% went for the TAVAR. And let's see what the data shows. So if we looked at all of the patients, um, and, you know, if you look at surgery versus TAVAR, in terms of all-cause mortality and disabling stroke, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, so again, we're not inferior to surgery in this risk population, right? Now, when we actually broke it up and looked at the patients that had transfemoral TAVAR versus surgery, we just about have a statistically significant difference in favor of the TAVAR to surgery in this risk population when it comes to all-cause mortality and disabling stroke. Amazing, amazing results. When you look at some of the other data, there, there was no statistically significant difference. Again, proving that we're not inferior and actually a lot of it in support of the TAVARs in, in the fact that we're like slightly better than surgery, but it's not a statistically significant difference. Of course, we see a difference in vascular complications um, with the TAVAR versus surgery expected. Uh, it was a vascular procedure. A lot more AKI or acute kidney injury in those that underwent surgery. And this is at 30 days and at two years as well. So TAVAR for low risk people. Well, there's been one study done outside of the United States. It was the Notion study, and it was done with the core valve and actually showed non-inferiority. Um, we have two ongoing studies in the United States right now in low-risk people. These are people that's operative mortality risk is less than 30%. Um, so we have the Partner 3, and this is the Sapien 3 versus surgery, one-to-one -one randomization, and we have the Evolute R which is the core valve versus surgery, one-to-one -one randomization, <clears throat> and we will be participating in the Evolute R low-risk study at Sinai. And the one concern that we all have is what is the longevity of the valve, but let's not go there right now. But anyway, very quickly, case study. Um, I have a patient with class three heart failure, history of AFib, CAD, pulmonary hypertension, anemia, osteoarthritis, he's on good meds, he's actually got critical aortic stenosis with a valve area of 0.6, preserved systolic function. We did a cath on the patient, we did find coronary disease and treated that prior to the TAVAR. We did our CT angiogram, gives us our annulus size, tells us our access, STS mortality risk, 4.6. That's intermediate risk, however, our surgeon saw the patient and determined the patient to be high risk because given the STS, in addition to the patient's advanced age, the anemia, the frailty, the pulmonary hypertension, this is a high risk patient. So the plan was for a core valve 31 percutaneous femoral access to be done under MAC without intubation. This is a quick look at what we're looking at when we look at the echo and how they're measuring the gradients. <clears throat> This is the CAT scan and how we're measuring the annulus. And I, what's important to point out here is look at these masses of calcium. So when I talked to you earlier about the paravalvular leak and the apposition of the valve and the good sealing, I mean, the, or, or, or risk for annular rupture, I mean, the, the, this is the problem. Although calcium is good because we can't latch the valve onto anything without it. So it's good and bad. Um, these are just some other measurements that we're looking at in terms of the CAT scan, different challenges. Um, the coronary ostea height I spoke to earlier, uh, this guy's in the clear. When the coronary ostea are 10 millimeters or below in terms of distance, then we're concerned that when you put the valve in, you're going to displace those native leaflets and you could um, occlude the coronary ostea. So he's clearly good. We've got 13.9 and 15.5, so no issue. And this is how we're looking at the access, what are our femoral artery sizing, and what is the, uh, how much calcium is there? You know, Do we need to do a cut down? And all these different questions that come up. This is a 3D image of the uh, CT scan, 
And this is really great for other looking at other challenges we might face, like tortuosity, aneurysmal areas, different things like that, that we can, you know, it's, we just really just dot all of our eyes. Uh-oh, she's beeping. Okay, so class three heart failure, critical AS, high risk for surgery, going forward with the core valve. Here are my pictures. Um, all right, so we're in place. And we are slowly releasing it. And now we have released the valve. Now we see severe paravalvular regurgitation. And I told you earlier, that's a really important complication to be concerned about. Um, it contributes to mortality. We don't want to do a procedure for someone and correct their aortic stenosis and give them severe AI. So what do we do? Well, we do a post-BAV. Let's better oppose this valve. Let's better seal this valve, right? So that's what we did with a 28 millimeter balloon. Now where are we? Here's our post-BAV uh, picture. We have moderate paravalvular leak. So what do we do? There's a lot of discussion that goes on at this point, right? Because moderate paravalvular leak is still a significant concern. It's not severe anymore, but it's still moderate. But we also remember those masses of calcium. Do we really want to go in and post-dilate this again with a bigger balloon and possibly have an annular rupture? I mean, that's a devastating event, right? So we looked at the hemodynamics. We looked at the whole picture. We know it's self-expanding. It, it'll expand more over the next 30 days. So we might even actually have improvement in, the, in our 30-day echo. Decision was, we're happy with this result, we don't want to take the risk, and we're good. So he did amazing. He went home the next day, and he's, he's done well since. So, um, so anyway, going forward, uh, we're always striving to improve outcomes. How we do this, having a good established TAVAR team and program, good patient selection criteria, improving operator skills, we've done I think 715 to be exact procedures as of yesterday. <laughs> so um, improving the valve sizing and positioning, judicious use of that post-implant dilation, uh, these um, subsequent device generations and reduction in sheath sizes, distal protection devices, I showed you the Sentinel device, better standardization of antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapy. This is something we're working on. We have an ongoing study looking at this. And establishing really good pre and post procedure protocols is vital. <clears throat> so in conclusion, currently the TAVAR is an alternative treatment for aortic stenosis and those that are considered to have a high or prohibitive risk for surgery. The results of the partner 2A and the SIRTAVI trial, and I'm going to change may to will, result in a paradigm shift in the management of aortic stenosis in those with an intermediate risk for surgery. The TAVAR results in marked improvement in valvular function, immediate hemodynamic and clinical improvement. And the results of the workup and the surgical risk assessment is what determines is this the right procedure for the patient. And I thank you so much for your time. <laughs>